Morning, Guy. Morning, Guy. How are we? Oh, well, I'm excited because, you know, Slade were one of my first loves. Um, Slade were my actual first love. They were the first records I bought, I can honestly say, to the exclusion of T-Rex. It was like I thought you couldn't like T-Rex if you liked Slade. See, I had Hot Love and uh, and and get it on come and feel the noise was probably about my third or fourth record and uh, sorry because i love you i should say that was the one i bought and um i went to see them the first band i ever saw live at the palladium uh, oh, okay yeah. you win so i win do i thank you <laughs> yeah but um, so i am excited because you know it's... no i'm excited it's it's noddy and i've got i i, I did meet him well actually we'll, we'll save it but um the time i met him because i was very chuffed uh and but yeah, one of the great, also the man behind the greatest burp in rock and roll history. That's right. I mean, also, I mean, we forget how big they were. This was this was the the biggest band since the Beatles. I mean, absolutely huge. You know, um, I think uh, more number ones in the seventies than anyone else. Slade than anyone except there was like six, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think Slade Alive went in. It was the biggest selling album since Sgt. Pepper's. You know, I mean, it was. Absolutely huge. And one of their singles were the first single to ever go straight in at number one since Get Back. That's right. And they had three. They then had three that went straight in at number one. Anyway, enough of us. <laughs> Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. So great to talk to two guys that have done this. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. Too, too. Get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Hello. Noddy. Noddy. You all right? Are we going to see you? You are if we can... Uh, air Yay! Yay! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You look so dignified and refined, Noddy. <laughs> you're looking great mate looking great you lot too we were just talking about You've been traveling the world haven't you we have yeah I'm about to again we're off to the states in a, in six days how's he going oh, it's been amazing it's been amazing yeah yeah no it's good to play on stage especially after all those years of well three two three years of it being locked down you know it's great yeah, to be yeah. back what about you are you getting out I'm doing bugger all, me. I'm retired now. I'm 76. <laughs> I'm having a lazy life. I find that hard adverts. to believe. I find... Paying me lots of money for adverts for doing very little work. Well, you have which a... suits me fine. It's that voice, isn't it? It's it's so recognisable and uh, and so British. <laughs> I've got I've got a story actually. I'd like to tell about your voice. Noddy, because you and I, you and I met at that Barnes lunch that uh, John Pigeon and Keith Oltham used to organise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was very chuffed because you knew who I was because I'd done a talk at Lipper and your son yeah. was there and I told you yeah, about yeah. it. But it yeah. was that really annoying thing, you know, when you get loads of people, Gary, and everyone's waiting for their food for ages, and then when the food finally comes, everyone's just talking, and poor waiters are standing there with plates, not knowing what yeah, to yeah. do. And someone brought a plate up to Noddy, and Noddy went. Chicken Parmesan! And, and it was like, with that amazing voice. And then someone, oh, sorry, that was me. And from then on, well, the, the, waiters just brought, the waiters just brought every meal to Noddy so he could shout out what it was. That's the trouble with <laughs> them lunches. You, the waiters could never be heard over the babble. Right. They could oh, hit, used to have to everyone heard them. over you, mate. Everyone heard over you. Fantastic. Oh, mate. Because <laughs> yeah, you are promoting a new box set that's just come out, are you, Noddy? I am, right? yes. Uh, it's... Uh, Five live CDs, three, uh, two have been out before, which is Slade Alive, the first one, of course. Come That's on. in it. Yeah. Slade on stage, the last live one we bought out. But the three in the middle are all never been heard bootlegs. And these tape bootlegs came to light. Somebody sent them me. And I had a listen, and they were good quality bootlegs for a chain. You know, you get these bootlegs yeah. and they go on forever and they're... Most of them are rubbish, but these three were absolutely good. And uh, we had them remastered, and they sound bloody great. Uh, one is from 1974, 75. It's the New Victoria in London. Yep. Uh, another one's the Reading Festival in 80, which give us a second wind. 
And the other one is a great one. It's a warm-up gig we always used to do. It's also from 1980, and it's a place called Hook No Miners Welfare. <laughs> and it's where we used to try out new songs wow. that we'd recorded but never done on stage. So it's a whole concert at this Hook No Miners Welfare, and it sounds bloody great. Uh, that's from your old manor, is it, I, I presume? No, no, oh, it's Hook No Miners Welfare. No, it's oh, over okay. in... Uh, Sort of uh, Nottinghamshire way, sort That's of over that way over the east of England. But, now. Well, look, but it's a, it was a great atmosphere place. They used to use it as a rock venue, like once in a blue moon. But the atmosphere was electric there always, as we always have a great it? time there. That well, was I mean, I just... meat pies or on the back of all. <laughs> <laughs> Just over my shoulder there, Doddy, you can probably see. That's my see it. that's yeah, my original yeah, yeah. copy of Slade Alive. From, from, oh, I think God, it was, okay. That must be about my, the second or third album I ever bought. Maybe the second. And um, I think Electric Warrior was my first. Sorry to mention okay. the competition. I've got Electric Warrior as well. Yeah, yeah, what an album. But, but I just want to say, having listened to the Reading Festival, I mean, this was a, a great... I mean, we could start with that first, if you like, because it was an extraordinary moment because you, you'd, you'd, you'd got, a, you know, you'd got a bit... Sl you'd slipped away a bit, Slade. Yep, yep. And, and, then, and then there was this chance, this opportunity to play the Reading Festival and top the bill. Just, do you want to just tell us the story? Well, we, uh, we'd been trying to get... As you say, we'd come back from the States. We'd had two years in the States. So we'd totally lost ground in Europe. And we came back, sort of punk was happening and all that stuff was going on. And we were, you know, we had to make a decision. Do we carry on or have we had our day, you know, uh, boring old farts? Uh, and we decided we'd carry on and start from scratch, go back to smaller venues. We were still writing and recording. We still had a record deal. We were still selling records in Europe. Uh, and uh, we tried to get on Reading two or three years running. Of course, we weren't cool enough to get on Reading because uh, we'd gone up, you know, we were on the skids at that time. And 1980 came along and Dave Hill, the guitar player, he pretty much left the band. He'd walked out, he'd had enough uh, because we were banging our heads against a brick wall and had been for a couple of years. He'd left the band. Then out of the blue, my manager called me and said, uh, Reading want you on. Ozzy Osbourne's band have dropped out. Now, Ozzy was going to be special guests on the bill to White Snake. He had the boot out of Black Sabbath and he'd formed this new band, uh, Blizzard of Oz. They apparently weren't ready to do shows. And I think we were bottom of the list that they called to replace him. Only at three or four days' notice, we were bottom of the list and they called up our manager and said, can Slade do it? So my manager, Chas Chandler, he called me and said, uh, they want you on ready. And I said, well, I'll call the others and see if everybody's up for it. Jim was up for it. Don was up for it. I called Dave. As I say, he'd left. The band had pretty much folded. And I said to Dave, uh, ready one us on. And he said, I'm not doing it. I've finished now. I've, I've made the decision. I've left the band. Uh, I'm not doing it. So I called Chas back, told him. Chas said, I'll call Dave. He could always talk Dave around um, yeah. Chas. So he called Dave up. He convinced him by saying, if you're going to go out, go out on a big one. You know, go out yeah. in front of a big crowd, not with a whimper. And he talked Dave around anyway. And we had no rehearsal. We had nothing. We had no backstage passes or anything because it was that short notice. No emails in those days. Everything came back. How did you get in? <laughs> <laughs> we parked in the public car park. We turned up in our, in the car, public car park, with our stage clothes in suitcases, our guitars in suitcases. We walked around the perimeter of the crowd to the backstage area. We had no backstage passes, but we knew the security guards on the gate. They'd all worked sure. for us in the past. I said, oh, come on in, you lot, you know. <laughs> Went to our caravan, and we just sat there waiting you know, for uh, the time to go on. Uh, started to get changed and that. And Tommy Vance was hosting the festival yeah. that year. The rock, he was rock GJ on radio one of those days. He come in the uh, caravan and he said, uh, you're going to storm it tonight. Um, nobody set the festival afire yet over the previous two days because this was Sunday evening. So we sat in the caravan and said, oh, well, we don't know where this young crowd will accept us. You know, they're a young metal crowd. 
and uh, obviously knew our records, but had never seen us probably. And he said, "No, you'll you'll be fine. You'll you'll be on and go fine." So <clears throat> we're sitting there waiting to go on, and uh, we had the message come backstage to us. Def Leppard, who were also on that yeah. bill, they were a new band at that time. They hadn't cracked through America or anything. They'd done some dates supporting us in UK right, just a right. year or two before, and uh, it come in that they wouldn't go on before us. Because we were the boring old farts, Def Leppard refused to go on before us. They wanted to go on after us. And we said, well, we're not bothered. You know, we thought we were at the end of the line anyway. We said, we don't care when we go on, you know, white snake with top of the bill anyway. It made no difference to us. So we went on. We had no idea what was going to happen. No idea. There was a big cheer when we went on because we hadn't been announced. We were the surprise. They were all expecting Aussie. And, uh, you know, the pit in front of the stage at Reading, he thought it was empty. No press in there, no radio in there, no TV, no media in the pit. They were all in the bar getting pissed. And so we goes on, we does our opening number, tore the place apart. We kicked into the second number. I didn't wait to do an intro. I just opened with, uh, took, went straight into the second number. And uh, the pit suddenly became full of the media because they'd heard the kerfuffle backstage. They'd heard the crowd going berserk. And we stormed it. It just grew and grew and grew, the reaction all the way through. Yeah, no, we've listened to it, and I've got to say, and it's because, yeah, the sound of the crowd, I mean, and uh, your performance is amazing. It's astonishing. Well, it's you know, we didn't know what to expect. And, of course, that drove us on. The sound of the crowd mm. drove us on. And, you know, you never get an encore at a festival, we've right. been told, unless you're top of the bill. You do your set time and that's it you're off well we we, we, we finished the show as we would normal i think we got 45 minutes the allotted set time and we came off and <clears throat> everybody backstage was raving the crowd were raving wouldn't let us go so the promoter said you better get back on and do another so we went back on did mama raw crazy now which was our regular <laughs> encore anyway yeah the crowd still were going wally when we walked off the promoter said, you better go back on again we're not going to quiet them yet so I went on and said, is there anything you want to hear? Just thinking they'd shout out various songs. And they all started to chant Merry Christmas, everybody. And I said, we're not doing Merry Christmas. It's August bank holiday. We're not playing that. You know, we never played Merry Christmas unless it was Christmas time. And uh, they were all saying, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. I said, OK, we're not going to play, but you lot singing. So I kicked them off in the chorus and, that, and all yeah. the crowd sung it, 65,000 of them. Sang the song. Now, Noddy, this is a, it's an amazing sounding record. I mean, it really is. I mean, you know, Slade, Slade Alive is is one of you know that is yeah, one of the greatest when, live albums of all time. This the most famous the burp in the energy. Record, yeah, we'll discuss the burp. But this has. <laughs> so I have to do much that energy. every every time after Slade Alive when we did Darby on Two. Oh, if I miss the burp off, the audience would go mad. Half the audience would burp. Anyway, <laughs> so look, just to fill people in who don't know, so on, on Dar Darling Be Home Soon, which is who who did it? It's a John Sebastian song, John isn't Sebastian, it? So yeah, delicate, right. beautiful. Yeah. There's this moment halfway through where you, you hear Noddy go, Burp. Yeah. <laughs> that went that one planned. It, oh, we'd been drinking, funnily enough, that that night that that's taken from Slade Alive Volume One, we booked a uh, command studios on Piccadilly. It's a studio called Mini Theatre. So we booked it for three nights to do a live album. Any crowd could come in. It wasn't a massive crowd at all. It was about a few hundred people. But they'd got all the studio facilities in there to record. So we recorded the three nights on the trot. What came out as the record was the second night. And we'd been at Top of the Pops that, that evening doing a Top of the Pops with what became our first number one, which was Cause I Love You. So we were over the moon. I helped do it. Look, I helped. Oh, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> that's my, I've got this. He holds the single. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd had a few bevies. We'd had a few bevies, of course. Get to the studio, command studios. We're all in a good frame of mind because Cause I Love You was, was up there. And it was, you know, massive record for us. And uh, we went on stage and... The plane, you know, we, we we really kicked it. It was great. And, of course, in the middle of Darling Beyond Soon, which was the one slow song we used to do in the set anyway, 
you know, I was ready because I've had a few beers. I was ready to burp, so I did let, let it out, so it wasn't planned at all. <laughs> Do you know what was odd? It, what's odd is that at that time, and that was a huge album, I've already just said. We said in the intro, you know, that was uh, the biggest it album. It broke us around the world. Uh, incredible. And Canada, it, it, Australia, all over the big, place. Biggest selling album since Sgt. Pepper's, I think it was, at the time. In Australia, but, yeah. But, but what's what's... What's sort of crazy and is only of that time is how bands could break on a live album. I'm thinking yeah, later on, right. obviously Peter Frampton, but 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 uh, really humble pie, humble pie. You know yeah. that rock, yeah. rock yeah. in the film, or and in a way, there's a that, that that you know it's extraordinary that you get to break on a live album. But you can understand when you've got artists who sing like you do or Steve Marriott does. Live is where they belong. That interaction Correct. between right. you and the crowd. We never matched up on record. I mean, we had a lot of hit records and got great sound on record. Your record sounded great. We never great. matched up yeah. to the live performances, really. You know, when you get in the studio, it all has to be a bit planned out. Not so much in the early 70s, because we used to go in the studio, take the stage gear in and bash out. We were an engineer's nightmare. We were. <laughs> but we liked the overlapping on all the mics, even though we were baffled off, like you used to have to be in those days. The, the volume we played at in the studio sort of leaked on the drums, the drums leaked on the guitars. Mm. But that's what got our sound, our unique sound. But we'd always loved albums, particularly like Live at Leeds, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. and people yeah. like that. We liked that sort of album. Uh, and Chad Chandler, our manager and producer, of course, who discovered and managed Hendrix, he'd been round the block. We hadn't really broke through with any hit records, he'd had us for a, a, about two years, couldn't get us play on radio particularly. And um, he said, your forte is live. We've got to bring the live album out. He said, the Who did it and whoever else had brought them out before that. He, I think the Stones had had, he'd get your yayas out. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. And he says, well, well, let's go with a live album. If that don't break through, Gordon knows what we're going to do. So that's that's why it came about. It was his suggestion, really. He'd, uh, he he pushed us to do it, and uh, we were quite happy to do it, quite frankly. And I'll, I'll make a point to you there. It was the biggest profit album we ever did. That album, yeah. totally, to record for three nights and mix it, 400 quid. No! <sighs> and it was in the charts just in UK for 13 months. I was going to say, no, no wonder I've never heard of that studio. It must have closed down if that's the sort of rates they were charging. 400 quid. <laughs> it, 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 you know, on, Picca on Piccadilly? <laughs> yeah, it was where they used to do... Um, it wasn't a big studio. It's where they used to do a little radio broadcast and that type of thing. It was that sort of studio. It wasn't a proper bona fide rock and roll studio at all. But it was... It was uh, I think it was... a. Uh, Hundred quid a night to book it, but, but people who people who probably don't listen to our podcast, guy, who much younger people who take these things for granted, wouldn't understand how Im uh, amazing it was that they when Slade came out their their next album that that went to number one and Slade Alive was at number two. You knocked that's, yourself that's, off number one. No one did that since the Beatles. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a phenomenal break. Yeah, basically it came out the next week. But... <laughs> and, it, and, it, <laughs> and it summed us up. That's the point. It, yeah. it summed up what we were all about. And that's what why the people liked it, because up until that point, we'd had Get Down and Get With It, which was a single that sort of showed what we were like on stage. It was a big stage record for us anyway, way before we ever recorded it. That was, again, the suggestion of Chas Chamba. He says, let's put it out, get down and get with it. It's a little we'll Richard do song, it wasn't it? The show. Yeah. A, 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 I would a, a, say, I would say, Noddy, that you did, you did actually manage to take that really heavy sound into the studio because you're, you know, your singles, all those I got, I said, you know, you were my first musical crush. And you actually had that really heavy, much heavier sound. That if you look at your contemporaries, like The Faces or um t-rex or whatever you, you had a very kind of metal big guitar sound yeah i mean well, the, the intro of mama we're all crazy now i mean that you can compare that to the beginning of anarchy in the uk can't you i mean it was yeah. a phenomenal yeah. guitar sound but, but that was down to trying to transfer our live sound onto record and mama is probably a good example that you've picked on that because that's probably the first time we ever created the guitar sound that we had on stage into the studio. I mean, Dave was very good. Dave, people slagged Dave off for his outrageous outfits and all that. But what Dave had 
he had a great chord sound. He wasn't a great, what you'd call a lead player. He couldn't play fast licks or fancy, fancy, bendy, bendy, fast licks. He wasn't that sort of player. But what he had was a great chord sound. And he used no boxes. That It was right. guitar into amp via, I think he had a treble booster. That's all he ever had. Yeah. And he had this sound which was enormous. Controlling it in the studio was difficult for the engineers. Humbuckers. Yeah. yeah but I, me and him combined... It was the I Super Yob guitar, time. wasn't it? It was the Super Yob guitar. He didn't use the Super Yob in <laughs> the early days. That was, a, that was a terrible guitar to play. He what's it, what's it from it. Madness has got that? No, Marco, yeah. Marco yeah. Peroni's Marco got it. Now. Oh, Marco's got yeah. it. Oh, OK. I, I, actually, yeah. I actually played it round at Marco's house years ago. It's impossible I was... to play, isn't it? <clears throat> it is, it is, yeah. I mean, we listen, we're going to go back and we're going to come forward, yeah. but I just want to, while we're just in this little bit of mode of you and how great Dave was live, I, I watched yesterday a couple of things. I watched uh, it's a footage of you playing in America on tour and there's a Granada special where you play live in front of a, a load of... Oh, I remember that. Yeah. In, in front of like a... A bopper audience. A bopper audience. And I'm looking for the pedals on the floor. But I'm also wondering where the monitors are. Because I no I went to the London Palladium to see you play. It was the first gig I ever went to. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. S supported by Geordie. Yep. And, which, and, and we'll get on to this later because there is a connection between you and the lead singer, Brian Johnson of Geordie. Correct. Right. There is a connection. But, but anyway, I... I I've looked at pictures since of that gig at the Palladium and there are no monitors on the floor. No. How did you ever hear your voice? Well, <laughs> that's a well, stupid says, question. He, right? he, no, how does anyone one. else hear their voice? I think Noddy could The only thing, <laughs> the way we used to do it, and people never sussed this in the very early days before we were famous, when we were doing little stages, we had two Vox 30s. And Jim had a, 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 a sort of a mini bass stack. No monitors. We had our PA on the side, which was a WEM, a WEM column each side. Come on. Which nothing went through the WEM columns except the vocals. It was, they were all 10-inch speakers, I think. Right. And what we used to do, which nobody ever sussed, was mine and Dave's amps, our Vox 30s. In his Vox 30, he had one of my speakers and one of his speakers. And the same, the other side, in my Vox 30. So wherever you stood in front of the stage, you could hear both guitars. Right. Whereas yeah. if you stood in front of a stage of bands in a little club, if you're in front of the bass, that's all you heard. And the other side, wow, that's all really, you heard. But I, we I, went we, can't, go, we can't go into the technical side of that, but I, mean, I wonder how you did that. It's just linking the speakers up. Oh, but okay. what about your vocals? We just... Uh, Cross crisscross the speakers across instead of having wow. two two Dave speakers in his amp. It was one of mine and one of his linked across the back right. of the drums. Very and it was a simple idea. And everybody used to go, bands generally. How on earth do you do that? <laughs> simple. But then of course when we could afford bigger gear, we did it with cabinets each side of the stage like that. Exactly the same. So we always had the same sound each side of the stage. Now all we had through the side monitors, when we had side monitors, when we had enough money to be able to have side monitors, all we had through the side monitors was Don's bass drum and my vocal. Wow. And all Don had through his monitors on the drums was my vocal. And yeah. we all played to Don's bass drum and my vocal, and everybody played to that. We didn't spend hours having a mix on stage of the guitars or, or whatever. But, you know, I just want to say, Noddy, thank you, because quite honestly, you know, being the first show I ever saw, and you were phenomenal that night. I stood on the seats. Were the you at the afternoon or the night show? Oh, I must... Mm, I don't know. I reckon I must have been at the afternoon. What? There was a much more young kids. Well, at the afternoon, <clears throat> when yeah. we'd arrived in the afternoon at that gig, it was, I think it was in January, wasn't it? And the pit, the orchestra pit, was full of the orchestra instruments and music for the panto. <laughs> and the panto had a night off, of course, on a Sunday, which yeah. the day yeah. we were on. They'd never had a rock gig at the Palladium before, a rock show. And all the gear was in the pit. And the, the organisers at, at the Palladium, we said to them, because it was something to do with joining the common market, the shows were. I can't remember where, but it was to celebrate joining right. the common market, those shows. That's poignant and, now, isn't uh, it? We said to the promoters, you better get all that stuff out of the pit because, um, you know, 
they're going to go wild when we go on because you know we were right getting these mad audiences yeah. and we said you better shift all this stuff now now we've had them all here we've had sonata sammy davis <laughs> Ella, you know, we've had them all here. i said but you haven't had a rock show you don't know what what it's going to be like so we opened up in the afternoon show we actually were behind curtains if you remember yeah the curtains pulled back of course the audience surged forward into the pit the music was going up, the sheet music, the, there was all, music stands all over the place. It was mayhem in the first five minutes. Uh, um, on the afternoon show as well, they cracked the balcony. The audience cracked the balcony really? at the Palladium. I was in the yeah. stalls. I, I, don't, I definitely wasn't under the balcony, thank God. Well, it was cracked, and we, wow. had, to, we had to sort of try and temper it on the night show because it was cracking even more. And we got banned. Mecca. Mecca at own that theatre, I think it was Mecca, and we got banned from all their theatres in the country after that That's show. amazing. Well, it changed wow. my life, Noddy, you know, because I, I, you know, I'd already played guitar at that time, you know, but seeing you, you know, seeing the theatricality of your band and the noise, that was it. From then on, I wanted it. That's all I ever wanted to do. Where did your bass your guitar play it on? Who, who, who's your favourite guitarist? Oh, when, well, when I started, there was it was Mick Ronson, to be honest. You know, okay. he was he was definitely and, and, good, and yeah. you know Ronnie Wood and but you yeah, know yeah. the but but the the glamour of what you guys were doing and I look at it now and I see it that that telecaster that you played and how raw that was you know yeah. let's talk about how it all started for you though Noddy I think we'd we'd love to dig a little yeah. bit deeper into yeah, your yeah. inspirations and influences was it a musical house yeah very uh, my dad uh, used to sing around the working men's clubs. He was, a, he was a window cleaner, my dad. Had no aspiration to be professional. He had a great voice. I mean, great voice. But in those days when you're working class kid, you never thought you could make money out of music. I'm going back to the late 40s, early 50s. Mm -hmm. His idol was Al Jolson. Uh -huh. And uh, we had all Jolson records in the house. We had all the swing bands, Sinatra. Can I just oh, hold you for one second then, Noddy? I want to mention it, because like, I think there's a, big quite con there's a big connection between what you do and what Al did, because Al, Al was before the microphone. So he Correct. had to sing loud. And the yeah. reason he was Correct. such a star was he could sing to the balcony and everyone would yeah. hear him. Yeah. And I used to use a lot of his tricks. Right. Al Jolson became my idol because my dad's idol was Jolson. So I knew a bit about Jolson. He was a little kid. I knew about Jolson. And he, because he was so big, people don't realise how big he was on Broadway mm -hmm. and how big he was in America. But he, the first he, talkie. He, the first talkie was... Yeah. yeah. But he'd also got such a big ego, much like myself, he got <laughs> such a big ego that he would put a show on on a Sunday. The Broadway show, it wasn't a night off for him because all the other Broadway shows on a Sunday night would come and see Jolson. And he'd been on a show in Broadway yeah. too. And he, and he built a platform going out into the audience through the audience so he could get close to him yeah. and entertain him. Now, I nicked that idea in about 73. I had a platform built out going up into the audience at theatres around the country. And Hammersmith Apollo, as it's now called, it wasn't in them days, it was no, the, the Odeon. Odeon. They had a pit. Now, it, the pit's not there anymore. That pit is covered over, wooden floor covered over it now, which is now part of the stage. I had that built so Did I could you? get to the crowd. Wow. And it's a Jolson trick. And they never took it away. The council never took it away. All stadium acts now have that. Jagger, Bono, Correct. everyone has that thing. Correct. And it's you, Noddy, it's you. Correct. I had it built and I had it built because of, of Jolson, because Jolson did it. Uh, and uh, my dad used to do the working men's clubs and on a Sunday night, me and my mum would go along to the working men's club with one regular one in my own town of Worsley in the black country. And on that, those nights, Sunday night, they'd have what was called free and easy. It's called karaoke today. Them uh, days it was free and easy. Anybody could get up and sing and all you had was a piano player. You might have a drummer sometimes, which was luxury, but mainly a piano player who just vamp along with whatever anybody wanted to sing. Now, I used to sing in the backyard and entertain the kids in the backyard because we were in a council, uh, you know, tenement uh, block that 
you know, three families shared a toilet in the backyard. And I used to entertain the kids doing put puppet shows and singing and whatever, charge them a penny a time, put that money towards buying records and whatever. And uh, my dad, this one Sunday night, he heard, he'd heard me singing in the yard. He knew I could sing and he played records in the house all the time. And uh, he said, come on, Neville. He called me Neville, my mum and dad did in them day. Come on, Neville, get up on stage. Let's see you sing. I was terrified. I was seven years old. And the number one record at the time in UK was Frankie Lane, an old country singer. I don't know if you ever heard of him. You're probably yeah, too yeah, young yeah, to yeah, know no, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We Frankie know. Lane. He, he had a song at the number one in the charts called I Believe. You know, the famous song, I Believe. He's a version. Number one in the charts, I believe for every drop of rain oh, that yes. falls. Oh, yeah, That song. I got up and sang it. Number one in the charts. A little soprano voice. And it took the roof off the, the, the work events club. And I thought, this is it. This is my taste of applause. <laughs> uh. And it was downhill all the way then. Downhill all the way. <laughs> And I'd found my vocation. Never thought for a minute I could make money out of it. But I went on and on then and used to get up every week then to uh, get up and sing in the, in the clubs with my dad. And uh, then the breakthrough with me, the big breakthrough that was my biggest, biggest epiphany, for want of a better word, is seeing Little Richard in the movie The Girl Can't Help Me. That came around in UK, probably 56, 57. I think Bowie said went, the same thing. Bowie said the same thing, I think. It yep, Bowie thing. saw it. A lot of rockers of my age. It was that or Blackboard Jungle, wasn't it? Those were the yeah. two. Yeah, yeah, it was sort of, it was the introduction. And the thing was, you'd heard the records, but you'd never seen them. You did not know what they looked like, these artists. So you go in to a movie like, don't mean they were crap movies, really, but you saw... Eddie Cochran, you saw Gene Vincent, you saw all these artists playing on stage and you, you'd never seen them before, you'd just heard the records. So Little Richard comes on in The Girl Can't Help It, playing the piano, he's got this rocking band behind him, these saxes all mm -hmm. doing the dance, you know, with the sax dances behind him. He's playing the piano, hair booth on top, thick makeup, because nobody knew... Little Richard was gay in those days. You yeah. know, you didn't know that was such a word. Shiny, silky suit and standing up playing the piano and dancing while he's... We'd never seen that in UK, anybody standing yeah. up playing the piano. And he's dancing while he's playing the piano and this voice coming out of him. And I left the cinema, I go, my God, this is, this is just incredible. Yeah. This, is, this is what I want my life to be. But Noddy, there's another bit to that that people said that, that the reason I think those films were so important and why Teddy Boys went mad and ripped up the seats yeah, yeah, was yeah. that record players at home were pretty yeah. polite little things. And yeah. so it was the first time you got to hit, not only see them, but you heard that music at that volume. In a big speaker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, And it's the same in coffee bars. We don't have them these days, coffee bars. In coffee bars, in my day, like, we'd, we'd go at in lunchtime from school break and... And after school, we'd go in a coffee bar where the Ted's used to hang out, as you say, and there's always a jukebox in the corner. And they'd always got the current hits on there, generally rock and roll hits, and pumping out of a jukebox speaker. You didn't hear that at home. Couldn't help but move you, you know. Was there, it was just amazing for a kid. Was there a club in the Midlands where a lot of these young kids wanting to be in bands gravitated to? Because I just want to think about those bands, because that was quite a scene, you know. You're talking about... Yeah. I, the Idol Race, which uh, yeah. with Jeff Lynne and, and, and yeah, yeah. the move obviously started. Steve Gibbon's band, yeah, um, Steve, ELO, yeah. Robert Plant in the end. Uh, yeah. But it was there oh, a place good, yeah, yeah. that you, you... Well, I used to drive Robert's band That's, about. Yeah. What? He, 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 yeah, this was before Band of Joy, wasn't it? This was another Oh, yeah, band. before Band yeah, of yeah, Joy. Yeah. Um, he, he, was, um, he, he left home. His mum and dad didn't want him to be a singer in a band and he was always knocking around, coming and watching bands. And he, he eventually he joined a band that the kids in that band were at school with me. They were a couple of them were at school with me. I still see the guitar player now when I'm in the Midlands. I still see him. And they never had a van to take him around. And Robert moved in it to Warsaw with one of the band. And they never had a van to run him around. They used to slum off other people and borrow gear off other people. 
And if my van weren't playing, I took my dad's window cleaning van and drove them around and unloaded the gear in and helped them load the gear and that. This way, I'm going back three steel wow. foot. And quite often, I'd had, I've had uh, Planty in the back of my dad's window cleaning van waiting for him <laughs> because he's got a... He's got a young lady in the back amongst the buckets and ladders, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know That's I, what I, you're I here for, folks. When I see him, you know. But, Remember the days in the back of the window cleaning van? <laughs> and uh, that's how I got to know him. And he used where's to the here, van? The where's that van now? Yeah, where's it's a that national van monument. Now. Yeah, yeah. It's one of them old Bedford dormobiles. Uh, but, you know, where the engine was inside and you, you, you warmed your backside on the engine. But you, you, you ended up playing in. Steve Brett and the Mavericks. What was that like? Is yeah, that, yeah. Did that... Well, I had this band from school who were we we, we became like sort of an R and B band uh, around 1962. We'd done all the pop hits before that and playing work events, clubs, ballrooms, that sort of thing. And this is all pre Beatles. All the bands right? you're talking pre Beatles, about, isn't it? Huh? Pre Beatles. This is pre Beatles, isn't it? So oh yeah, yeah. So probably what you're yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. But then you'd be doing all the ballrooms, you know, and, and uh, I saw the Beatles in those days twice around the Midlands when they were wearing leather jackets and before they really oh, wow. had the Beatle cuts. They were a, a filthy rock and roll band. They were bloody great then, doing the cavern. I saw them a couple of times. And you'd never imagine that they would be become the biggest band in the world. There's, there's no way you would have imagined it. Why, no, were they not all that? They were they not all that? <laughs> They, they just got something different. Yeah. They were, firstly, they got all their arms turned up full. Whereas bands at that time were very polite, very polite playing. Yeah. Many of them, most of them, based on Cliff and the Shadows. Right. There was only some nitty nitty gritty rock and roll bands around in those early sixties, late fifties, early sixties. Beatles were one. Johnny Kidd and the Pirates, I remember. Yeah, right. Another. Come on, fantastic. I saw them. Screaming Lord later. Such and the Savages was another. They had all these musicians pass through those bands. You know, people like Richie Blackmore passed through those bands. You know, all mm -hmm. such in the savages. He had all sorts of famous musicians went through his band. And uh, <clears throat> you'd go and see him at the local club, the local ballroom. Or so the what local club? Was there one particular band? club, Noddy? Was there a particular uh, club? Well, the clubs in the Midlands, really. Around Wolverhampton, there was the Ship and Rainbow. That was a regular club. There used to be uh, Warsaw Town Hall, where they used to have nine bands. Bloxridge Bass, they used to have nine bands. Willinor Bass, we played a lot. We played on in Willinor Bass. We used to play there a lot. We opened there for Cream. Wow. Wow. With Robert Plant's band on the bill as well. This is when you were Slade, right? This is when you were Slade. No, 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 no. This was this is the in between us. Cream. This is very between. early days, '66. We played with the Move there. We played with Jeff Lynn's Idle Race. We used to play with all this. I'll tell you who was the cracky Midlands band at the time who used to impress everybody. Uh, one was the Moody Blues. Oh, yes. And Denny Lane was the singer. And the other one was Spencer Davis Group. Yeah, um, yeah, I yeah, remember yeah. going to yeah, see yeah. Spencer Davis Group for the first time. Yeah. I heard these people talking about the Spencer Davis Steve Winwood. Yeah. And I went to a, a ballroom in a, a place called West Bromwich, which is in the Midlands. Went to, went to see in this ballroom, uh, I forget, the Delphi Ballroom, I think it was West Bromwich. And I'd heard this talk about Spencer Davis. And they came on, they sauntered on. They'd got the tiniest little amplifiers you'd ever see. They were Burns amplifiers. Burns. <laughs> Never seen them since. Don't know whatever happened to Burns amplifiers. Uh, remember Burns guitars, you still yeah. see them, but not the Burns amplifiers. They got these little amps on stage, tiny, one speaker's in each camp. And they came on, they sauntered on, blum de blum de blum. And they started off, and they started off very quietly. And I nicked this idea as well for Slam. They started off with a song. It's my, just not with Stevie singing, uh, with Muff Wynn, with his brother, yeah, who was yeah. bass player, and Spencer. We're on one mic, and they went, It's my baby, it's your baby, it's my baby, you're so fine. And they went like this for, for about a minute, you know, boogie, boogie, boogie long. I thought, what's all the fuss about? And just suddenly, in the second verse, comes in, Winwards behind the keyboard and organ, Hammond organ, and suddenly you hear, I like the way you walk. And it was like, <laughs> Ray Charles. <laughs> wow. This kid, he's 14, 15, and he's doing Ray Charles. He, what is this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what a band. Uh, what, did you, what did you copy it on? What did I you... nicked that opening. 
we used to do a song by uh, 10 years after called Hear Me Calling. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Hear me calling, yeah. yeah. Hear me calling. Slay the live every time. Yeah. Hear me yeah. Call, dead quiet. Then suddenly, bang, next verse, the riff comes in out of the room. I nicked it off Stevie, Stevie Winwood. Because on, on your first Slade album, obviously, on that very first beginnings album, you know, when you're Ambrose Slade, you did do a lot of those middle. You did a Justin Hayward, Moody really Blues track, didn't you? And, yeah, uh, we did an Idle Race track. Idle Race track, yeah, by Jeff Lee. We did a, we did a, a Frank Zappa track. We did um, a, a band that Ted Nugent was in at the time. Of the, uh, of, of the Ambrose, was that the Ambrose? Yeah, and by yeah. Duke. And by Duke. We did and by... This was all our stage act at the time. We're yeah. playing anything and everything. But let's get on because to the. Let's get... who, 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 yeah. I want to know how you and Dave met, though, because you were in you were in the rival bands, weren't you? The yeah. vendors. We were the and... rival bands, yeah, in Wolverhampton. And uh, it's funny, but Dave asked me to join the band, and he'd never seen me sing. But Donna, the drummer, he'd seen me. And our tour manager who became Graham Swinton, they come to watch my band all the time because, as you say, we were sort of their rivals. And um, we were going out on a boat to Germany, both bands going out to do the German clubs. In '65, this would be. And I used to play the German clubs a lot with the band with the Mavericks uh, that became the Mavericks. And uh, their band was going out, the original In Betweens, and we met on the boat. And we were chat, chat, chatting. And Dave and Don sort of come away from the rest of the band and they said to me, we're thinking of splitting the band when we get back. Do you fancy joining us? And I said, no, because my band were, I'd formed them from the off. We had brass section. We had organs. We were doing James Brown, Sam and Dave, a lot of soul music. I loved all that stuff. We were in the clubs in Germany doing that. People used to love us. And I said, no, I'm... Love me, old my band. Well, we had a singer who did half the show, and I did the other half in Steve Brett and the Mavericks. And I fell out with Steve Brett while we were over there, mainly over money. He was taking a big cut of the money because he was a bit of a celebrity in the Midlands. He was a TV star. He had his own TV series in the Midlands. He had oh. the Beatles on there, Jerry and the Pacemakers, all the Liverpool. Is, so, is, 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 does Alan um, Lake copy him? Is he trying to be him? Pretty in much. The film? Pretty much. That sort of guy, yeah, pretty much. Steve Brett was a bit more clean cut than Alan Lake was in Flame, but it was pretty much the same sort of thing. And he was taking a big clunk of the money. And uh, I had a bit of a row with him because we got stranded in Germany. The van broke down. It's the middle of winter. And me and the uh, the other guitarist in the band, we stayed over to get the van repaired and living with two chicks over there. And... Uh, so, it, you know, we had to make our own way back, pay for the van to get back with all the equipment. So when I, when I get back home, I left the band. And uh, just out of the blue, I was walking down the street in Wolverhampton and I bumped into Dave and Doug, who by this time had, let, had sort of breaking up their band. They'd auditioned for a bass player. They'd found Jim, Jimmy Lee. They'd already got him in the band. So they'd been doing gigs, a few gigs with Jim and the singer they had at the time. And they said... We've heard you left your band. Do you want to come with us? And we said, I said, well, I've got nothing else to do. Yeah. <laughs> and we had a, we had a, uh, I said, we'd better have a rehearsal, see if it worked, you know. And we went to a pub over the road from um, my mum and dad's house, a place called Three Men in a Boat, which was another venue where bands used to play. They had every band going there at the Three Men in a Boat. And he, he used to let me use it for rehearsals, the guy who owned it. He was actually uncle of John Bonham, who became a drummer with Led Zeppelin. <laughs> oh, uh, and that was his pub. And um, he let us rehearse in there, uh, you know, on this afternoon for nothing. Because I used to play there regular anyway, play gigs there. And uh, it clicked and it sounded great. And we decided then we'd be a band. Because the, the that's more or less how it happened. We listened to 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 I I know I did, and then I sent it off to Guy. Guy had already listened to it. It was the, this very small faces sound of the in between. Yeah, the, very small faces. Is it the in betweens? Yeah. It's the in betweens, not in, the in betweeners. In betweens, yeah. And, in and, betweens. And, and it sounded very. Sm and I know how much Robert Plant loved the small faces as well, because he he ended up, I think, got in a bit of trouble by copying some of the lyrics that that Stevie <laughs> Marriott had, oh, yeah. uh, had written, or, or copied himself. Um, but but. You had well, came... funnily enough, Sorry, go on. Robert Plant, when, when, I, when I, the singer that was in the in-betweens when I joined, 
we had dual singers there. I did half the set. He did half the set. He was a great singer, it, but he all they could all they did in there in the days before I joined him was blues. They only did twelve door blues, and he was a great blues player, a singer and a blues harmonica player. He was great, but Dave and Don wanted to move away from the blues. They didn't just want to be stuck in twelve bar blues, so that's why they asked me to come in. And I was doing Sam and Dave, Joe Tex, yeah. a lot of Motown stuff, you know, and that's the sort of but, stuff we. But you had Ken, Ken Foley. Ken Foley produced that early record, didn't he, for the in between? Kim Foley. Kim, Kim Foley. Sorry, yeah. sorry, yeah. Kim Foley. Kim yeah. Foley, exactly yeah. what I meant to say. Sorry. But our singer had left then, Kim Foley. Yeah. Who went on to, you know, manage Joan Jett. Well, he, he produced way. two massive records already, worldwide hits. He produced Ali Oop by the Hollywood Argyles. Which was number one in America. Yeah. There were novelty records. Um, he was a loony. He was an LA loony, but he he, he he could spot a hit, and he produced B Bumble and the Stingers, Nut Rocker. So he'd had two massive hits, and we were doing gigs all over the country. We were playing at a club in Oxford Street called Tiles, and he spotted us in Tiles. We were opening for can't remember somebody who'd had one hit, one of these solo pop star guys. Can't remember his name. It's the the nineteen ten fruit gum company. <laughs> no, this is a solo artist in, in tiles, and we were opening for him. And um, he saw us play there, and he come in the dressing room after. He says, "You guys, I love you guys. This is sixty six. I love you guys. You project. I, I, I've never seen a band project like this. Band. We were in our early stages. We'd only been together a couple of months." Yeah. And he took us into the studio, Region Sound in in Denmark, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and all the guitar shops are. He took us in there for an afternoon. We cut six tracks, and one of them being a cover of the Young Rascals' "You Better Run," which was number one in America at the time, hadn't been a hit here in the UK, but we played it on stage because we did all these weird, different things. And he says we're going to put that out, "You Better Run," and, and he, he put it out over here. It didn't do anything. But it, it, it really shows us in our embryo stage. And at the time, Robert Platt was in the band that I used to drive around. He brought it out as well. He'd heard us do it. Yeah. And he brought this record out as well. And there was, for a time, when our singer left, the you want to go who was there before me, that there was talk of Robert Plant joining us, coming in with us. And Jim never seen Robert Plant. So him and his brother... We went to see Robert with this band that I used to drive around because he knew I was a big pals with Robert. And he went to see Robert. He, you know, he to, wanted to ask him, you know, do you want to join us? But he was never going to, I don't think. And uh, Jim went to see When he came back, Jim and his brother, he said, what did you think of him then? He says, well, he didn't really sing. He said, he just danced about a lot and <laughs> shouted <laughs> sings. Oh, boy. Yeah. And I told Robert, I said, he called you the dancer. And, he, and Robert said, that's about right, eh? Nothing. And I remember Robert coming to see us uh, at some show in, in about 69, it was. And he said, I've been offered a job to join the New Yardbirds. <laughs> and, uh, of course, New, York, New Yardbirds, uh, I mean, the Yardbirds had sort of finished, but mm -hmm. Jimmy Page had got contracts to fulfil. And uh, Scandinavian said, dates, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Robert said, uh, they've asked me to join, and they said... Uh, we're doing these Scandinavian dates. He said, and then go to America. He says, I don't know whether I should do it. I said, well, you're at a loose end here. You know, um, what what you, what you got to lose, really. You're not doing anything here. He was being in a band, a band of joy, maybe, or one of the bands he was in around the Midlands. I said, but you will get a chance to go to the States. Now, you know yourself, the States was the holy grail for yeah, any band yeah. cool. to go cool. to. Everybody wanted to go. And I said, at least you'll get to go to the States and, and gig there. And he said, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Anyway, by that time, he dragged along John, John Bonham, who was well known in the Midlands for being the loudest drummer. Everybody, every band he played, he, he drowned the band out. It was like John Bonham's show with it. And they were playing like, oh, it's mainly the hands in green. But you just heard John Bonham drum solo. Pretty much. <laughs> just don't look him in the eye. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I mean, he was a big pal of mine, John, and, and Planty. And uh, Planty, and then he got, he got John into Zeppelin, of course. Well, who became Zeppelin after one American tour. Uh, Let, and that's, that's let's get let's get back let's get back to to Slade because Chaz Chandler yeah. I owned, I never knew Chaz Chandler really 
I mean, were you, were you sort of only, were you guy, were you made aware of Chaz via Slade? That's how I kind of got to know. No, no, no. No, 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 and particularly in America. They had a lot of number ones in America and got ripped off of all their money pretty yeah. much. But everybody thought they were a, a black band till they went to America because of Eric Burden's voice. Yeah. Great singer, Eric Burden. Yeah. Chaz was the bass player, who the bass was featured on a lot of the Animals records. Particularly, we got to get out of this yeah, place right. with a bass rip. And so I knew Chaz visually, of course, and he's playing through that band. Then, of course, he left the animals, the animals split up. And Keith Richard, I think it was, told Chaz, there's this guitar player in New York down in the village, playing in Grange Village. In a club, you should go and have a look at him. He's good, he's a good player. Didn't look any like the Jimi Hendrix we got to know. Chaz went to see him and said, uh, was very impressed. He was looking to go into management then, Chaz. He had enough of bands. He said to Jimmy, um, you fancy coming over to UK and forming a band there and we'll try and break her in UK. And he did. He brought him over. He he took him. They Between them, they formulated the Jimi Hendrix image, the wild haircut, the clothes, because Car Carnage Street was way open at that time. Yeah. Took him to a hairdresser that created the Jimi Hendrix haircut. Same hairdressers he took us to to get the skin head cut. <laughs> oh, who was that? Yeah, that, the guy called yeah, Harry to... had his place in Soho. Harry who? Or, I don't know what his second name is. I can't remember his second name. Oh. He's still cutting hair now. He cuts my daughter's no. hair now. He does oh, now. where, where, where Ooh. in Soho? No, no, he's not got a shop anymore. But he oh. only, only up until recently, only up about five or six years ago, he was still had a shop around Soho and, and that area, the West End. Because you're very well coiffured, it must be. Oh, he doesn't do me. He hasn't done me for no, years. But someone, keep someone does. <laughs> we text one and I, I text him dirty jokes and dirty videos. <laughs> uh, but we do keep in touch. Because Chaz convinced and he created you. A Chaz convinced you to be skinheads, didn't he? Because it he wasn't did. a skinhead band. In, in a way, it was a bit like when um, when uh, was when it the when, Who became mods. When the Who became Correct. mods. Yeah, yeah. Exactly the same. Chaz said we've got to get an image. We we've been with him a year. Couldn't get any get noticed really. We were doing plenty of live gigs around the country, and he said, "We've got to get your image." And a PR man who we knew, who used to write for the New Music Express, became our PR man. A guy called Keith Alton. Oh yeah, I know Keith. Keith yeah, yeah, I know Keith. Yeah. You know Keith. Yeah, yeah. And he and he, he said to Chaz, uh, he said, "Why don't they have the skinhead image? Uh, the, the you know the Ben Shermans, the Braiders, the Levi's, the Doc Martins, crop their hair. They'll look like the kids in the ballrooms." And it was a follow-on from yeah, the mods, yeah, really, yeah. the thin head looking now. It wasn't a political thing at all. And uh, Chas said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, when Keith was out the way, he went, right, that's great. This was like a red rag to a bull for Chas. This was like a spot. Keith called him the next morning and said, I was only joking yesterday about a man with in him. He said, too late. They're down at Harry's having the record off. <laughs> We've got the Doc Martins, we've got the Ben Shermans, and it was too late then. I've seen a picture of you all in all your skinhead gear, but still with the hair. So it was like there was a weird crossover period. Uh, yeah, with a cap I had, yeah. Well, yeah. that was a sort of, we'd started to, we had to move out of it slowly because we were having a backlash, mainly from BBC right. Radio and Telly to get played. And then we started to move gradually away. Kept the look, but coloured it up. There you go, and that, but and so was it, and was it was it literally overnight to full glam? No, 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 very no. <laughs> gradual. Uh, we still had the same look. I had the braces, the shirts, the short trousers, the boots, big, big sort of uh, like Doc Martin boots, but they're all coloured now. It's all yeah, coloured because yeah. you did the, you, you had the flat cap, bit like the skinhead girls did. That's how we gradually moved to more colour. Right. And also, because one thing I would get is um, the musical relationship in the band was very much you and Jim, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, from that point on, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because, because that's because... interesting. Because on that first, second, on that second album, it's yeah. everyone's writing. You're writing with yeah. Dave. Yeah. And then yeah. suddenly, 
it stops and you're well, just mainly it was Jim and Don writing together and me on my own or me and Dave uh, but it wasn't going anywhere from a, a point of view hit records just well we're going nowhere here. what down me and Jim had written a couple before um, and he said we need to look for a hit formula some three minute hit songs and um, well, let's sleep you and Jim up. So Jim came over. To, I was living at my mum and dad's then. And uh, Jim came over one afternoon with his violin. Chaz had to, write, to write a three-minute pop hit, he yeah. came round with his violin. <laughs> <laughs> what a skinhead. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> we dad get down and get with it. Right. And Chaz said, you must write your own, re- your own song next, hit, next record. You come round and... When we used to tune up the violin in the dressing room, because we used to play violin on stage on a couple of songs. I remember that's the thing. That's what I think. That's why Jim used to win Musician of the Year every year. Yeah. was because he was the bass player and violinist. Well, he was so impressed. Try. Yeah, that's right. We he had all the, the charms. Yeah. We were yeah. we were rock and roll notes. Anyway, he come round and he got his fiddle. And we in the, when we used to tune up in the dressing room before a gig, we'd play Django Reinhardt, Stefan Gapelli type stuff. I've never heard. Is that of it. why your son is called Django? Correct. Now, can I also say, Guy, on, on, on Noddy's Instagram site, which I don't think he posts on at the moment, but but there is an old, old, old that's picture of him. Oh, I, that's a fake, fake Noddy old Oh, movie. my that's God, me. right. Well, there's an old picture. Because there's a lot of porn. There is a lot of porn. <laughs> Isn't that well there? <laughs> there's an old picture of him in the band, in, I think it's in the in-betweens, and he's playing a, n- n- an unconventional chord shape, put it that way. He's a yeah. good player, this man. So, uh, Freddie Degville, the guy's name, was the first taught me. He was a great Django player. I'd never heard of Django Reinhardt until that point. So, in the dressing room, we used to do Stefan Grappelli Reinhardt type stuff to, to warm up and tune fiddle. And he brought it around. We got this sort of rhythm and lick, which became Because I Love You. We wrote it in 20 minutes. Yeah, wow. Dead simple. Never thought it would be a hit. Took it to Chaz, played it like that, acoustic guitar, me singing. Jim on the fiddle to Chaz. He said, I don't only think you've written your first hit, I think you've written your first number one. We went, oh, get away with you, Chaz. And uh, we poo-pooed it. When he recorded it, thought it was a bit weak. Oh, well, it's a bit poppy. Then we did what we did on Get Down and Get With It, put on boot stamping, hand clapping, slidified it, bang, number one. <laughs> And where did that idea for that hand clap and boots? Was that because that was obviously on on on? From on... get to get with. But where did it come from? Was it? Was it whose, idea, yeah, whose idea was it? Uh, well, it was on the original uh, get down and oh, get okay. with it record. Oh, the little Richard one. Yeah. Oh, I uh, see. Not so loud as we made it, but it was part of the lyric. When it all started to go insane for you, and it, you did, you were, and I said to the guy earlier, you were probably the biggest band since the Beatles. There'd been no question. Really? The madness, yeah. the madness of kids, follow, me being one of them, Guy being one of them, running around trying to find you, see where you are. How was it for you? Did you feel that that, that encumbered your creativity? That you had to concentrate on other things instead? Uh, it's weird, isn't it? When you finally get the hit record you've been chasing, you want more hits. You want more hits. So a lot of people... You got you got managers on your back. You got record company on your back. Don't forget in those days, <clears throat> our contract was a five year contract, not like today. We had a five year deal. We had to produce a minimum of three singles a year, with B size, not to go on albums particularly, and at least one album a year. At least one album a year. You were lucky. Elton had to do two albums. Did he? Well, yeah. Well. That's how it was in those days. Yeah. So we did, in a way, have to churn them out. And, of course, we were primarily a live band, so we were touring all the time. We were doing, like, maybe 250, 300 shows a year around the world after you've had your first hit. You're not just doing it in the UK. You've got to go to Europe, you've got to go to Australia, Japan, blah blah, blah and finally America. And when you when do you sit down and write? I mean, you know, Gary, for God's sake, how difficult it is to come up with new brew product all the time. He wrote an album on our tour. Did he? <laughs> cool. Yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes you could do that, but I know under the pressure of, of celebrity, which is you yeah. what you were under. Yeah. Is there, did was there ever a moment? Because 
listen, everyone's audiences were young, you know, because there were old people never listened to, to music, rock music. So, you know, you look at the Bowie show at Hammersmith, you see it's, it's just kids in the audience. But yeah, was yeah. there ever an element that, that where you thought, oh, I really, I'm not sure this is the audience I wanted, that I wanted the, the guys who were in the colleges. Was there ever that sort of, you know, I'm a, that you've ended up in, in pop. Yeah. Maybe Jim would want that. Yeah, I, I think Jim would say he wanted that. He was like, um, if he'd been left with him, he wouldn't have gone on tour. He'd have just worked in the studio. He'd have become a Brian Wilson type character. Right, right. Um, right. He never took to the rock and roll lifestyle like the three of us did. I mean, we we lived it to the max because we know, we knew, or we thought we knew. It might be a very short-lived thing. Little did we know we'd go on for twenty-five years yeah, together, yeah, yeah. the original mm -hmm. band. Um, well, no one, no one had. Yeah. No one ever had. You know, I mean, nobody had approved yeah. that, had they? Yeah. I mean, the Beatles only lasted ten years, really. Um, and uh, so we, you know, we didn't know how long it was going to last. So if we, if you got your first tickets, <laughs> you can't regret it. You're getting swanned around the world in first-class travel, first-class hotels. Yeah, I'd been on the road. 10 years before I'd hit, I'd slummed it up, sleeping on the top of Shap Fell before motorways in icy cold fog and snow because you couldn't drive through the snow. Slept all night on the on the engine, the van engine to keep warm. I'd been through all that Robert, shit. Robert wasn't in the back on that one, though, was Robert he? Robert wasn't. Some, wasn't that, no, Robert wasn't. <laughs> well, Robert would be too... You know, I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> Not, Noddy, what I made, I remember so clearly, I made in my art... It was, I think it was my first art lesson at school, and I made... Um, a, a cutouts of you, and I put each each limb and each kind of joint was um, had a little stapler thing in, so you could turn it and move the arm. Really? And then I had two sticks, each attached to one of your boots, and I really? played the record in front of my teacher in the class. And I went boom, boom, lifting up your legs, stomping on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you uh, are making me feel old now. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, oh but, but the key That's to it, brilliant. the key, and also I had a little hat on with silver foil, foil mirrors. Cause I've got some silver foil from my mum. <laughs> but where did that hat come from? That hat, oh, the top that was, hat. That was going to be my next question. Oh, yes, sorry, guy. Hat, come on. Sorry, guy. No, 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 mate. No, no, no. You, you had I, I heard Freddie Mercury. <laughs> well, everybody, it. it's grown up. It's an urban myth, really, that Freddie sold it to me. Freddie had a stall in Kensington Market in those oh. days, back in the early 70s. Him and Roger out of Queen they had this stall there that sold shirts and silk scarves and that sort of paraphernalia. And I was looking for a top hat that I could stick mirrors on, but it, it couldn't be a curved top hat like the proper top hat. It had to be a one you could stick the mirrors on flat-sided. So it was your idea, the idea yeah. of the top oh, yeah, hat yeah, 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 yeah. And I wanted a coachman's hat. Anyway, we used to go to, me and Dave used to go to Ken, Kensington Market in those days. And we used to buy shirts and, and stuff off Freddie. And he wasn't, he wasn't a pop star in them days. I mean, I think they just started to rehearse together, him and Brian and, uh, and Roger. And because um, Brian and Roger had been in band together. Smile, I think they were called. Smile, Freddie yeah, was trying to get his way in there. And uh, Freddie, uh, Freddie sort of knew who we were, and that me and Dave. And he used to say to us, Freddie, um, um, "I'm going, I'm going to be uh, 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 big pop stars like uh, like uh, you boys, uh, darlings, uh, one of these days. I'm going to be." He said, "Oh fuck off, Freddie, you're not going to." <laughs> and we just take the piss out of him, and he took the piss out of us as well. And we knew him all his life, all the Queen. We knew very well, oh. and um, we used to have a, a good laugh with him. And uh, but a couple of stalls away is where I bought the top hat, the coachman's hat, was just a couple of stalls from Freddie's. People say I don't ever grew up that everybody said Freddie sold it, but he didn't. But it was a stall near his stall. Yes, it was. And how did it stay on? Well, it was heavy. That's how it stayed on. <laughs> I stuck mirrors all over it. They were proper mirrors, and uh, it was very it heavy. I could boiling. wear it for about three been... songs. And it, I put it on, and of course it would stay on because it was so heavy. And I used to do the first two or three songs in the show. Then we come to a point in the show where I'd black the auditorium out totally and just have a pin spot, hit the hat, and it would throw out these huge beams from the hat. And it was like the Pink Floyd mirror ball. Gigantic mirror ball. 
yeah. and I could move it around the audience and, and it lit the audience. It was an amazing effect. Yeah, it was. Dead simple, yeah. but amazing effect. And if you'd never seen it, you could literally hear the audience gasp when the lights went out and this hat went bang. You could hear the gasp from the audience go, whoa. And I was obsessed with those trousers rolled up, weren't you, Guy? I remember, I actually had... Oh, the, yeah, the, uh, the tartan trousers. Yeah, yeah. Basically rolled I've still up. got some. And that was a skinhead, yeah. that was actually a skinhead thing, wasn't it? The rolling yeah, up yeah. of the of the, of the trousers. All copied from the skinheads, that uh, short trousers and the... Uh, and, and instead of the bother boots, of course, we had the platform shoes, the pla you know, big, chunky shoes. I used to wear a lot of Doc Martin style, style shoes in the early days, but coloured ones. But one of Jimmy, uh, Jim's uh, suits is in the V&A now, isn't it? The it is, yeah, granny, yeah. One of his... Uh, granny Takes a Trip. I think trip. he bought it from Granny Take a Trip. Yeah. Uh, that used to be on the King's Road. He bought it there and they put it in the V&A, yeah. Obviously, you can't ever stay there that, that long. No one does. We all have our moments in the, in the sun. And then, and then obviously, we're, we were happy to see you came back so strongly in, in the 80s. How did that begin to feel for you, that falling off? Well, actually... Looking back, because I watched half of it yesterday. Oh, I've fallen off too it, soon, you mean, Guy? It, you're right. It's laid yeah, in flame. Yeah, it, because it's brilliant. But having gone through that for a few years, you make that brilliant, really gritty, stood the test of time film about, you know, which is very, very... Good. But what I'm, what's interesting is it's how close it is to you. But did someone bring that script to you finished or was that actually written as you... Well, finished? half and half. Yeah. The original script, that was brought to us, not by the guys who wrote it eventually. The original script we had to make a movie, that was Chaz's idea again. He always followed the Beatles' blueprint. But, I said, but it's, 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 it's very far from a hard day's night or something. Correct. It's closer to like quadrophenia. But he wanted a blueprint of make a movie. We'd had all these records go yeah. straight to number one, first day of release. The next step he wanted was a movie. But the first one that came along was... Uh, uh, you, you, you guys are too young to remember, but in the fifties on TV there was a, a TV series called the Quatermass Experiment. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, we yeah. know that Quatermass yeah, Experiment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, we were going to do a spoof on it called the Quatermass Experiment. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to be pressed the Quatermass, uh, but the Triffid. We have this Triffid horror thing at the start. He ate Dave at the start in the first fifteen minutes. And all you saw to Dave for the rest of the movie then was his fringe hanging out the Triffid's mouth oh. and a few squeals from inside the Triffid. Because Dave was having none of that. He was having none of that. The second script we got was from a guy called Andrew Birkin and Richard Longcrane, who became the director. Jane, Jane Birkin's it, brother, wasn't it? Correct, you are. And um, anyway, they sent this script and it was your typical script of about a band written by somebody who's never been in a band. It was like what people imagine it's like in a band, but not the reality of a band. And we said to Richard and Andrew, come over to America for five or six weeks with us and tour. See what it's like on the road with a rock and roll band. So we took them to the States and while we're travelling in planes or in downtime, we told them stories about us we told them stories about other bands we knew. So every scene in Flame has happened to some band at some time. And there's a bit that was nicked by Spinal Tap. Correct. Isn't it? Yeah. Correct. Anyway, they lasted on the road with us two weeks. They came back with nervous <laughs> breakdowns, apparently. <laughs> and, but out of that developed the script that became Flame. And basically they'd seen our characters because they'd spent a lot of time with us. They saw our characters, what we were like personally, as well as on stage characters. And they pretty much based the characters in flame around that. It's My character was pretty much me. Jim's character was certainly Jim. Yeah. Jim had, had had a nervous breakdown by the end of the movie because he was living what he was like in real life. And Dave <laughs> the same. Dave was the funny. Don had had, had, had his accident when we filmed. Right. He couldn't remember a thing, but he come up with some good stuff. Don. Because <coughs> I remember when Don had his accident, that was, I remember that was, it was so cataclysmic. And it yeah, was like, that 73. was, that was oh, the end. Do you know what? Do you, we were never going to see Don Do you know again. what? There are like, times when you always remember, you know, like we remember when JFK was shot. We remember when the Queen died. I remember hearing about that accident and we were, same we were all at uh, a, a sports day. Yeah. 
two days before, the day before, the two days yeah. before, I'd seen Bowie at the Hammersmith Odeon. Ah. And I remember being in my sports day and every, the, well, the rumour went round about, uh, about this car accident. It was shocking. Well, he was given 24 hours to live. We thought he'd had it. We really thought he'd had it. Gradually improved um, over a period of six or eight weeks. He was in intensive care in a big tent thing. Uh, I went to see him the day after the accident. And, I mean, looking back on it now, it's in the far mists of time. But at the time, he'd had all his hair shaved off. He'd got cuts into his skull. There's no way you'd have thought he'd survive. No way. But he was built like a brick shit house, Don. Mm -hmm. And he, his strength, and his strength of character, and his strength, you know, his physical strength, pulled him through. He's great but in the movie. He could not remember a thing. He couldn't taste the smell. He couldn't remember the songs. He remembered nothing. And for the next two years, it was like, we had to take him back on stage to, a, to see if he could play for a start still. Mm because the doctors told us that's what we've got to do. We didn't think he would be able to carry on, but he did. Jim would tell him how the song started while I was chatting to the crowd. As soon as he started, he could get through the song. Wow. First track we ever recorded after his accident, we went to New York to record, and we keep him out of the UK and Europe limelight press. Mm -hmm. Took him to New York in the recording studio. That first track we recorded after his accident, was Merry Christmas, everybody. Oh. Whoa. And he couldn't remember it from start to finish. Oh, my God. But the only thing live on that record, which is not the way Slade ever recorded, is the bass drum. He put the bass drum on all the way through, and we had to build it like a jigsaw. And you, and wow. you did tried it. playing it all the way through, and I would down the mic, and i would got the cans on down the mic, saying to the drum roll comes now, Don, here he comes, bubba de bubba da, and he go bubba de bubba da. And that's how we had to work in the studio for two years. Yeah. Uh, and he could not remember a song for three minutes, a new song, couldn't remember it wow. from start to finish. So you're saying that he shot the film after the accident? He did. Wow, because uh, he's phenomenal uh, in the film. We'll okay. be out a year later. The opening titles on that film, because I, I, I haven't... I don't. I didn't remember the film, and I watched it again, guy. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, Mark yeah, it's Commode it's said fantastic. it's the Citizen Kane of pop music. He did. Of pop he, did. Music. he does still does, yeah. But that that opening song, uh, you as that, a fan in those days, did you like it? Yeah, uh, most fans didn't. I did, I, I did like it. I think, you know, I can't remember if I, um, and I can't remember to be absolutely honest, Noddy, if I, if, uh, okay. how I felt, but uh, I was certainly, yeah, I, remember I do remember, because I, I still think to this day that How Does It Feel is one of the greatest songs you, you've ever recorded. It was, yeah. 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 Uh, so you you write, that, you write, uh, and you write great ballads. You write, you great, made that, you, know. you made that piano lick since school. And he, uh, uh, it's like, you can never obviously find out where to put it. But of course, when the movie came along, he said, I'm going to use that lick for the incidental music as well as the as for the song. Uh, because didn't he bring up Merry Christmas, everybody? It was something he remembered of yours from yes, way back. My, it was, that was the from first song I ever wrote wow. in 67. The chorus was a, was a hippy-dippy song I'd written, and I played it to the band at the time. And the, the Merry Solstice. Chorus, was it Merry Solstice, everyone? <laughs> <laughs> I went to the chorus. The chorus went... Um, don't forget this is hippie days. The chorus went, um, so won't you buy me a rocking chair to watch the world go by? Buy me a looking glass to look me in the eye. <laughs> and I played in the band with a verse as well. And the band went, rubbish. Noddy, your house wouldn't be as nice as it is today if you'd stuck with those lyrics. <laughs> oh, correct, 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 Monday. So uh, Jim remembered six years later He'd done this chorus, he'd done this verse uh, of a melody that he, he, he'd created and his, his mom-in-law had been banging his ear, oh, you'd never be able to write a Christmas song sort of thing. And he poo-pooed it at the start, but he, he got this verse melody and he remembered the rocking chair yeah. song from me and he, he put the chorus melody to it, played it to me, and he says, I think this is commercial. Uh, and, and my mother-in-law has challenged us to do a Christmas song. I think only Lennon, in sort of the year before, we didn't think it was cred at all to do a Christmas song. 
But Lennon had done it, so we thought, well, we'll have a go at it. And we played it, jazz. he said, I think it's great, we're going to do it. And uh, we're going to record it anyway. And I went away that night after Jim had played me what he got. And I wrote all the lyrics in one night after a session at the pub. And I just put down everything that I remembered about a family Christmas time thing. And we went to Charles, played it, he loved it. Uh, we recorded it in New York, as I said, we had to do it in bits and dabs. Bits. Where, where in New York was you record? Record plan in New oh, York. Plan. Well, Fantastic. Lennon, yeah, Lennon course, recorded. Yeah. And we the start that keyboard start opening chords of Merry Christmas is John Lennon's harmonium. We, oh. we borrowed it. Oh. the opening chords. Um, and that's the only thing sort of Christmassy on it besides the lyrics. Isn't it? Isn't now, it? There's no choir. There's no jingle bells. There's nothing on it. It's a rock pop record with Christmas lyrics. Yeah. And it, it, it stood the test of time. In France, it was number one at Easter. Because in those days, it took oh. so long to get played on national radio in France. <laughs> How wonderfully like contrary. Huh? <laughs> How wonderfully contrary of the French. Beautiful. <laughs> I, I, what was funny is you Midlands chaps that all knew each other were both fighting for the number one spot. Didn't Wizard Correct. have it out the same year? He didn't year. know Woody was doing one. He didn't know we were doing one. Elton was also doing one that year. He didn't know we were doing one. And uh, it was a, it was like a battle of the Christmas records, which nobody realised was going to happen. But luckily for us, we'd done it in New York. It was a hell of a marathon to do with the way Don was. Brought it back to Polydor Records. We hadn't told them we were doing a Christmas record. Uh, they were pushing us to bring out a record at Christmas, but no mention of a Christmas record. And uh, we'd had all this trouble with Don's accident, trying to took him out on tour in America to try and get him back playing. Charles brought the, the tapes home, played it to Polydor. They flipped and said, this is going to come out. We're going to put everything we've got behind this. Because we'd already had two straight in at number ones <clears throat> that year with yeah. Come On, Feel The Noise and Squeeze Me, Please Me. And um, they were the, the presses in Britain were overwhelmed by the pre-orders. They had to go to Europe to have it pressed as well. Uh, we'd done over 500,000 pre-orders before release. So in those days, that was a, a silver record. Nice. In those days, 500. So we got a silver record day of release. The first reorder day on the Monday was 350,000 reorders on the wow. first reorder wow. day. Pop stars can only dream today of having yeah, anywhere close absolutely. to that. I mean, it did a million up to Christmas. Uh, it was phenomenal, the sales, phenomenal. But we never got another number one after that. You know? But, but you know, what's funny, guys, that really, you know, up until Slade made that record, Christmas was always a Dickens invented it, right? Correct. And then now yes, exactly. it's Noddy. Yeah. You know, well, and I'm not, I'm not even being funny. That's true. You know, you've, you've embedded yourself in our Christmas culture. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. So, I've played it. I've used to do the Notting Hill Panto and we used to end with, with uh, here it is, Merry Christmas. He's still got a So I've played it. It's great fun to play. I love playing I love it. It's got, it now. it's got one great chord change in it. That yeah. one great sort of key change in the chords. Yeah, yeah. I love it now when kids come to me in the street at Christmas time and they'll say to me, we, we've just done your song. They call me Mr. Christmas round here, and as if we'd ever did any other song. And um, they say, well, we've just done your song at the Christmas Carol concert. I mean, that's great, though, isn't it? It's great to have a song like that. Oh, God, of course like it is. That, yeah. so, and it's been a good pension plan to us. Um, I felt... We never, I... when we did it in 73, it's 50 years old next year. We never imagined it would last 50 years yeah. but no one imagined anything no. was going to last true, anything true, you, know, true, you know absolutely true you're right but so noddy because i know time is marching on where does noddy come from from neville that was a nickname at school that was when i was in infant school i remember the guy that gave it me he was the guy called john robbins and i was uh, sort of at school when the teacher asked me anything if instead of saying yes i used to go nod me head. Yeah. And they, he, he latched on, the guy called me Noddy, and then everybody called me Noddy, except my mum and dad and, uh, and me, my aunties and uncles. They never called me Noddy. They always called me Neville. And people who are close, closest friends to me now still call me Neville because they sort of set themselves apart from everybody else oh. who knows me. So no. my old best friend, I've had my three closest best friends 
all three die in the last three or four years. Oh, I, I all used oh. to call me Neville. I don't oh. look on it as... So there was no one in your class called Big Ears then? No. <laughs> <laughs> but Dave used to be called Big Ears. Yeah, Dave, yeah. that but, was you know because we used to make a gag on stage. I love the sorry, I love the bizarre way that a Ambrose Slade came about, which is your original A and R man. Apparently, his his secretary named her handbag Ambrose and her shoes yeah. Slade. Yeah, he hated it, hated it. But we wanted a record deal, so we had we took name. He didn't like him between the record boss, a guy called Jack Baverstock at Fontana. Why should she call her handbag Ambrose? I don't know. She named everything. She named everything. She got different <laughs> names. So Jack Bavisock just took two things, put it together. We hated it. Chaz hated it. So he said, we always got it wrong on ads for concerts. Am go sled. Arnold Slade. <laughs> Never correct. Never. Ambrose Slade had a strange yeah. hobby. It was one of them, yes. <laughs> and anyway, Chaz said, we'll shorten it to Slade. It's simple. And funnily enough, Slade in the dictionary means earthy, hey. which suited us to the great. Hey. Just a pure fight and accident, really. Well, it's also a fine arts institute. Yeah, yeah. It's no, we, we, and, we, it, and it's a designer place as well. Apparently. That's we can't we can't go really without s s talking about how much you influence so many other people. I know yeah. my you mentioned Def Leppard earlier, but I know how much Joe Elliot adored Slade. In fact, he showed me, when I went to his house, he showed me the ticket stubs of going to see you at Sheffield oh, City cool. Hall back in the early 70s. Cool. Um, and that sound of your records was definitely the sound of so many other bands that, that had happened. You know, well, even we found bands... out in later years, yeah, we didn't realise till later years of the number of people or number of bands that had seen us through their lives, particularly in America. Yeah. Uh, because we did, couldn't catch a cold in America in the 70s. Um, certain areas we could. Mid Midwest, fabulous for us. Cleveland, St. Louis, Detroit, oh, all the great rock and roll cities, fabulous for us. We had number one records in those areas. Philadelphia Spectrum, it's a 20,000-seater. We could top the bill there without a hit record. Blue collar, blue collar cities. Yeah, New York wow. was okay for us. LA couldn't catch a cold. San Francisco, some gigs were good, some gigs not so good. But some way, LA was always a jinx. We have a song called LA Jinx. It was always a jinx wow. for us. I don't know why. Don't know why. But that, it, that's just the way it was. Joe Strummer, by the way, also once said to me that you were the, the greatest voice he'd ever heard live. Who did? Joe Strummer. Oh, good the man. Clash. There you go. Well, look, I like I like compliments. Well, John Lennon once, said, <laughs> when we were doing an album of, of the record plan, Chaz, of course, knew John Lennon. And we used to have the studio till 10 at night. And then he'd come in, say, 11 or 12 o'clock. Him and Yoko would come in and they'd do whatever album they were making. I think they were making mind games at the time. Oh, and, right. and he came in uh, while Chaz was still mixing one of our tracks. And he come in, Lennon, and he said, uh, oh, this band sound all right. He said, that singer's fucking fantastic. Uh, Best compliment uh, uh, ever, uh, John Lennon. Yeah. And Lennon didn't give out compliments. Look, Noddy, no one sounds like Very. you, mate. Nobody sounds like you. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. that voice, it was been such a pleasure listening to it for the last couple of days, hasn't it, Guy? Yeah, absolutely. It really has. And I'm actually probably going to carry on a bit, frankly. It's been really, really, it's been such a lovely rabbit hole to go down. Really Good luck with this live box yeah, set. Yeah. Noddy. We're going to have to get him on again, aren't we? We'll have to get you. Come on yeah. again and join us. And we'll like, oh, we'll do, yeah. The there's, lots yeah more, there's lots more filthy tales to tell. Oh, I, oh we know. We, we did even mention Sharon Osbourne pointing a gun at you. At ah, yeah. <laughs> Many tales to tell. Yeah, there's, there's tons. There's tons. There's tons more. There's tons we haven't got to. Thank well, you when so you've been much. around at my age, you know, you've, you've been through a few stories. Indeed. Everyone should go and listen to uh, well, listen to Slade live for, first of all because it's one of the greatest live albums ever made. But listen to the news and stuff. watch Slade in Flame because oh. it is the Citizen Kane. Of, I forgot of to rock tell you while we're talking about Slade in Flame, the best thing, one of the funniest things I'll always remember about Slade in Flame. I told you about how each of us, our characters, are based on ourselves, yeah. including Dave's. And Dave didn't like the film when he t in the end because he thought it was the wrong sort of thing that the fans wouldn't like. And they didn't originally. They didn't take to it, really. And he was sort of right in his own way. But Dave, when we were filming, 
he only read his parts. He hadn't got a clue what the story was about. This is typical Dave. <laughs> typical. He only read the scenes he was in. So he had no idea of the plot or anything. But that was Dave, you know, that's the sort of character he is. And that's what made up Spacey. We were yeah. four parts of a jigsaw, all totally different. I remember characters. you all turned up on a fire engine for the premiere, didn't you? We did. But it was freezing cold. It was raining. We sat through the premiere amongst all the celebs and God knows what, all the other bands that were there, freezing cold, soaking wet from the bloody fire engine because <laughs> some PR thought it was a great stunt. Oh, listen. Very well, nice. mate, thank you so much for coming on. We've been looking forward to this for I've so long. I enjoyed it. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you so much for being like you know first musical crush. Yeah. The guy I used to play, I used to mime guitar in the, my primary playground to the girls Excellent. on the bench. Oh, I like it. I like it. I like it. Lots of love, Noddy. Keep on rocking! Yeah, yeah baby. <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye, mate. All the best. Uh, bye, bye, Noddy. Cheers. Thank you so much. Oh, what a pleasure to have that man on. What an absolute pleasure. And again, we have only scratched the surface. He could, the guy could clearly just go for it. I know. We, we did. We hardly got a word in edgeways this week, did we? I know. I felt, I felt bad kind of interrupting. But the thing is that if you don't interrupt, yeah, nothing's going to happen. I mean, it was quite funny. He was he was ready to give us like half an hour on the Chaz Chandler, Jimi Hendrix story. And you're kind of thinking, I think our listeners know that. Yeah. But also, I want to hear the <laughs> Noddy Holder story. Uh, well, I yes, think we've got quite a lot of it there. What a man, what a man. What a humble, fantastic, happy storytelling. Yeah, I could, you know, I was at, we were at his feet there, weren't we, Guy? We were sitting, we were the adoring children sitting at his feet, listening to the old Mariner's Tales. It really was. Right, we're, uh, we're on the road ourselves. We will endeavour to come up with someone for next week. We will. We will do our darndest, uh, even though multiple time zones and all sorts of faffing will come between us and you but we won't let it stop us it's good night from me and good night from them mm-hmm.